from the National Catholic Register. This is Register Radio, bringing light and clarity to the news and topics that affect your life. The U.S. Supreme Court and summer movies are the subject of our show today. By a surprising vote of 7-2, to two, the Supreme Court this week ruled in favor of a Colorado baker who had refused to create a wedding cake for a homosexual couple. It was an important step for defenders of religious liberty, but it's not the end of the story. We talked to Michelle LaRosa of the Catholic News Agency about the implications. And then there are summer movies. And of course, we turn to Stephen Gradanis about the good, bad, and the must-see movies of the summer. I'm Jeanette DeMello, Editor-in-Chief of the National Catholic Register and co-host of Register Radio. And, of course, I'm joined by Matthew Bunsen, the Register's Senior Editor and co-host. Hello. Good to be with you. I seem to remember there was a time when summers were pretty quiet. Not not anymore. I cannot remember a time when my summer was quiet. (laughs) So, uh, yes, the news does not stop. And, of course, we're happy to have uh, Michelle LaRosa on with us uh, in Denver, Colorado. Hi, Michelle. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So Michelle's managing editor of Catholic News Agency. I miss the days I worked in your office, Michelle. Uh, we'll be back in Denver soon to visit. So Great. Uh, yeah. But um, so the, this case about uh, Masterpiece Cake uh, really started out as a Denver case. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's great that you are on the show, um, being there in Colorado, that uh, you can describe where this began. So what is uh, the Masterpiece Cake case all about? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, this is kind of right in our backyard. And the case actually goes back to 2012. Um, and uh, the baker, Jack Phillips, owns Masterpiece Cakes, And in 2012, there was a same-sex couple who came to him and asked him to make a cake for their same-sex wedding ceremony. Um, Now, back in 2012, of course, same-sex marriage was not recognized in the state of Colorado. And um, Jack just explained to them that that would violate his conscience, that he was not able to do that. And he did stress that he would be happy to make other kinds of products for them, a birthday cake, a graduation cake, something like that. But he just said that that, um, gay marriage itself was something that went against his deeply held religious beliefs, and he was not able to to make that specific custom cake for them. So this case uh, basically wound its way through the courts and ended up at the Supreme Court. Um, It's really the first such case that they are... Um, that they made a decision on, that they, there was a ruling on, and it, it was seven to two. So it was a very important um, uh, win in, in some ways. Um, Justices uh, Elena Kagan and Stephen Breyer, as well as Justice uh, Anthony Kennedy, who you don't always know how he's going to vote on this, um, they all voted um, in, in favor of, uh, of Masterpiece Cake Shop. Um, that's very important. Um, but many people, Michelle, have said this was a very narrow ruling. So what did the Supreme Court decide in this particular case? Yeah, so um, it was it was a narrow ruling in the sense that they decided it on narrow legal grounds, which means they didn't consider the question of free speech. They just considered the question of freedom of religion. But just through the lens of freedom of religion, they said that there's two main reasons that Jack Phillips should prevail in this case. Um, One of them is that they said it was clear that the initial Colorado Civil Rights Commission that initially considered the case, the Supreme Court said it was clear that they were hostile towards Jack Phillips' Christian beliefs. They didn't treat um, his beliefs in a neutral manner. They did not treat his beliefs with tolerance and respect. Some of the comments that they made showed um, that they really were very disrespectful towards his Christian faith and they were not willing to give it a fair hearing. Uh, yes, I thought it was um, It's also remarkable uh, that the commission uh, did not act in the same way um, regarding other bakers. Uh, so that was also a part of their um, decision, the Supreme Court's decision, uh, was that they saw that there was uh, inequality in the way the Civil Rights Commission handled other bakers' cases. So describe that a little bit more. Right. So the the second reason that the Supreme Court used in supporting Jack Phillips was that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission had these three other instances of a different individual who went and asked 
different bakeries to make a cake that had an anti-gay marriage message. And in those cases, the bakeries refused. And the commission said, well, in this case, it was okay for these bakeries to refuse because they don't want to have to put this message on their cakes. Mm -hmm. But then with Jack Phillips, they said, oh, it's, it's not you who's actually putting this message supporting gay marriage on your cakes. It's it's the consumer. It's not the maker of the cakes. So they used a different logic when they were weighing these different cases. Yes, I think you um, do a great job, Michelle, in the in the analysis piece that you wrote for Catholic News Agency. Uh, it's titled Understanding the Supreme Court's Masterpiece Cake Ruling. And this was published on June 4th at CatholicNewsAgency.com. Uh, the Register also has a piece that came out a couple days later by Brian Fraga, it's called a half-baked decision. U.S. Supreme Court issues narrow ruling in same-sex wedding cake uh, case. And this, in in Brian's piece, he he kind of talks to various legal scholars who are saying where this might go. Like, what's the impact? How narrow is it? How significant is it? And uh, one of the experts is uh, Jerry Bradley at Notre Dame Law School. And he says, you know, this is really narrow. I don't even know if there are going to be other cases uh, that this particular ruling will affect. And then we have another scholar who in the same article um, uh, reference says, no, actually, I think this is a, a, a big case. Uh, this is uh, Doug Laycock, a professor at University of Virginia Law School. And um, he says the people who are actually going to have to think twice now are the regulators. And, uh, Michelle, you kind of point this out. No longer will the Civil Rights Commission be able to act in such an unequal way. Uh, So it seemed that in in your analysis that you thought this was a pretty significant, um, significant ruling. Yeah, I think um, the concern out there is that some people are saying, well, what this ruling does is it, is offering a liberty to rule against Christian wedding vendors as long as you're careful about your language and you Mm -hmm. don't betray any open hostility towards Christian beliefs. Um, But I think the thing that's key here is that um, it makes it clear that any kind of hostile and inconsistent enforcement is unconstitutional. So you'll have cases where they're going to be looking at this and saying, "What, what are you doing in the opposite type of cases if someone is requesting an anti-gay marriage message or some other message that you disagree with, are you allowing these vendors to opt out in those cases? Um, so, it, you know, it's not, it's definitely not a broad ruling that's going to affect every single case that comes before a court, but I do think there will be some other cases that we'll see mirroring the ruling here. Now, if I understand correctly, the, uh, the Civil Rights Commission uh, actually has already been reconfigured, hasn't it? Yes, that's true. So are we seeing that as a result of this case? And, and I ask because uh, are we also potentially going to see much more caution on the part of civil rights commissions that are pretty aggressive around the country, especially in certain states? Uh, will this have any impact on them, do you think? I think it definitely could. The, some of the shakeup in Colorado was seen as a response to, uh, to this case even before the Supreme Court ruled on it. So I think you'll definitely see commissions, at the very least, being careful about the language that they use, but perhaps even more so reevaluating some of their policies and weighing the way that they make decisions about some of these cases. What's next, Michelle, for Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop? Uh, where does this uh, case go now? Um, at this point, you know, it's been interesting in the last few days, Jack Phillips has has had both outpouring of support and also kind of hatred. Um, he's had, you know, there have been rallies showing up at his, his door um, supporting him, and he's also continued to get hateful phone calls. He's had death threats throughout this whole thing. Wow. Um, so I, th- I think probably what's most difficult for him is that he, for years, had just run a simple bakery and wanted to continue doing that. So he's, you know, for now, he's left in peace, but um, he's now a name that everyone knows um, not necessarily, you know, in a, in a positive promotional way. Does his case, um, I mean, was it actually decided or does it still need to kind of go back to a lower court or something like that in a, in a technical sense? Is, is, could there still be a case against him since uh, the court did not decide about free speech? They just decided that his expression of his religious belief was treated with hostility. So this particular, that particular complaint 
um, the Supreme Court has decided on. So there will not be another case for that particular complaint, but it could be raised again if an, if a, a same sex couple wants a cake and and the commission does not act with religious hostility, um, open religious hostility, then it could turn into a case where the free, free speech considerations are considered by a court. Okay. Yeah, uh, Michelle, uh, one of the things that was, was noted about this case is that Kennedy did uh, take the time in the majority opinion to reaffirm uh, gay rights or homosexual rights. What can we draw out of this particular decision, if anything, of the, the current dynamic of the court when it comes to these types of uh, speech cases? Mm -hmm. It looks like what the court is trying to do is draw a balance um, in which religious freedom is protected and this idea of gay rights is also protected and trying to figure out what that balance is. Um, of course, when, when gay marriage was legalized, the Supreme Court said, okay, this is now going to be recognized throughout the country. Kennedy does go a step farther here by saying that um, that in, in these cases, gay people should not be subjected to indignities when they're seeking goods and services on the market. So now it's looking more at, does this person feel that their dignity has been violated? And that is somewhat vague language. And I think that is leading to some of the concerns about whether this could open the door for um, rulings against Christians. Um, so so th that is taking it one step further when we're talking about dignities in the free market. Um, at the same time, it's not it's not opening the floodgates like it could have if the ruling had gone the other way and said you're never ever allowed to refuse service if you disagree with with um, with a particular uh, event such as a gay wedding. So it seems most likely that many of these other cases that are out there, there's a, a florist in Washington State, a web designer in Colorado, a calligrapher in Arizona, all of this having to do with people who do direct services to, for, for weddings. Uh, all of these cases, one of these cases, I should say, is bound to make it back to the Supreme Court. And uh, at some point in time, they're going to need to clarify uh, what they mean uh, when they... Uh, when they say there needs to be this mutual respect, because it, it's just not uh, inherent in everyone to know exactly what that means. Well, Michelle, we're really grateful uh, for your reporting on this. You've you've done this beat for a long time, so uh, we appreciate your insights. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. And of course, our, our listeners can go to www.catholicnewsagency.com. Uh, to find the latest coverage on these religious liberty cases and much, much more. When we return, we'll be talking to Stephen Gray Donis about summer movies here on Register Radio on EWTN. More when we return. Father Wade Menezes talks about the National Catholic Register. As the National Catholic Register celebrates its 90th anniversary, I think that says a lot about the publication. It works. It's solidly Catholic. It presents the teachings of the church, unabashedly so, and also guides its readers to be even more solidly Catholic themselves. One of the major effects that I think the Register has on its readers is that it elevates the intellect. Whether it be a faith item or a news item, it presents the news and the faith item in a very balanced way. One thing that the Register can never be accused of is being too far left or too far right. It is solidly Catholic, right in line with the chair of Peter. And I think that says a lot about the register. For a six-issue free trial of the National Catholic Register, go to ncregister.com and click on the six free issue banner or call 800-421-3230 for your six free issues. And as you await your first issue, enjoy some of our online content. Let's return to Register Radio on EWTN. Welcome back. I'm Jeanette DeMello, Editor-in-Chief of the National Catholic Register, and I'm joined, as usual, by Matthew Bunsen, uh, my co-host and a senior editor of the National Catholic Register. So Matthew is the movie viewer. I am uh, I'm someone who doesn't get to see very many movies these days, but there are many Hollywood big releases that are already underway um, for the summer, 
And our Catholic moviegoers always like to to know what movies they should see and what movies maybe they want to avoid. Uh, so we, we like to offer uh, this opportunity uh, to give you some ideas of what to look forward to and what to, to make sure you put in your summer viewing. And here uh, joining us now to help guide us through the summer is our film critic, St- Deacon Stephen Graydonis. Uh, Deacon Stephen, welcome back. Hi, Jeanette. It's good to be back. So, Matthew, I'm going to let you jump in because you <laughs> have probably already seen some of these movies as I have not. I have. In some cases, I wish I hadn't, but yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I can own, my heart goes out to you, Deacon, because uh, I know you have to see a, a vast number of films every year. But when yeah, you yes, have any... Writing about them is very cathartic. <laughs> very good point. Yeah, well, I was going to say that uh, here we are already in the summer blockbuster season, and the the king of Hollywood, as you like to call it, is Disney's Marvel Cinematic Universe, or the MCU, where they yes. have managed uh, to create a, not just a franchise, but an empire of films. And just, what, in the last couple of months, we've had Black Panther and now Marvel, and more on the way. Yes. Uh, uh, Marvel has apparently declared that summer now begins in February with Black Panther, and they've already <laughs> followed up with Avengers Infinity War. We haven't even gotten to Ant-Man and the Wasp. And, and the third movie on this year's top films uh, at the box office is another Marvel hero, not part of the MCU, uh, Deadpool, the Ryan Reynolds franchise. Um, DC is is really uh, kind of reeling in, in Marvel's continued dominance at the box office. And, Mar- and Disney is trying to do the same kind of shared cinematic universe with the Star Wars franchise. Solo, which is in theaters right now, is kind of their first box office stumble. So we'll see how successful they are in, uh, in trying to perpetuate that. Yeah, so we have the Marvel Cinematic Universe compared to uh, the, the much more problematic DC Universe. Uh, they've had some real problems trying to get that off the ground, haven't they? Yes, and I don't know if Aquaman in December is going to turn that around. Next year, That we've got Shazam coming up, which is about DC's Captain Marvel. That's not to be confused with Marvel's big screen Captain Marvel coming next year, uh, who's actually a woman, uh, Brie Larson. Next year, I, I do expect Wonder Woman 2, which brings back Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot to, uh, um, to build on the success of the first film in that mm-hmm. franchise. So we have uh, one film after another, but there doesn't seem to be any sort of uh, consumer or viewer exhaustion where this universe is concerned. Is that a consequence of just good filmmaking, good character building? What is it about the sort of insatiable appetite for these Marvel films? I, I, maybe they've sold their soul to the devil. I, I, it's, I, <laughs> I, I really, I really am curious to to understand just how they've managed to be so successful with what is really very television style filmmaking on on a big screen format. For me, this is something that, on in a in a very important way, doesn't work because a movie has to be a big event. You're spending money. You're going to the theater. You're sitting down for you know, two and a half hours potentially. And yet these stories are all middle act. They don't have a beginning, a middle and an end. They just string you along. And maybe, maybe that is the secret. Maybe, maybe the secret is just that people have to, they, they want to keep coming back because they want to find out what happens next, but you never get the exclamation point at the end of the sentence. And, and that was certainly the way that I felt about Avengers Infinity War. I, I admit, I want to see the second, the second installment. So maybe that's the answer to your question. That's sometimes what happens to me and, and why I don't start a new series uh, just on mm-hmm. Netflix or whatever, because I don't, I don't want to be strung along. I just don't have time for that. I just want to see something that has a beginning, <laughs> middle and end. Um, but it's actually really hard in general to find something like that. Um, You do have uh, uh, some family movies this uh, summer that those are the kind that I'm probably more likely uh, to see. Um, Although my kids are really too young to take to the theater yet, but it's the kind of movie that I enjoy because I I don't have to think too much. So what are some of the family uh, movies I might enjoy this summer? So I think without question, the the 800-pound gorilla in family entertainment (laughs) is going to be Brad Bird's Incredibles 2. This is a movie that we have been waiting for for a very long time. Uh, and and I you know the the first Incredibles I think is one of the ten greatest animated films ever made and Brad Bird is is clearly a very gifted filmmaker he picks up in this film I just saw it this this morning and this afternoon with with my uh, my lady Suzanne and uh, so he picks up right where the first one left off with the appearance of John Ratzenberger's Underminer 
um, <laughs> which turns out to be a waste because the movie doesn't really have any idea where to go with him. Instead, <laughs> it's a story about an effort to rehabilitate supers in the public eye. And the upshot is a reversal of the first film where now Elastigirl has a wealthy benefactor who's putting her into action while Mr. Incredibles stays home with the kids. So, oh, interesting you know, reversal. it's about exploring that, that family relationship within this larger dynamic of society's relationship to superheroes. And I think... I think Brad Bird has a lot of good ideas, as he always does. I don't think he pulls them together as satisfyingly as he did the first time around. Okay. What about anything else in the in the family realm or in the animated realm? Um, you know, I'm a little bit looking forward to Teen Titans Go to the movies because really? I, well, I'm so <laughs> What's the exclamation with... point we have to add? <laughs> yes. You know, <laughs> I'm I'm so frustrated that we we seem to be pitching these move these superhero movies always all the time to the PG-13 audience. Okay. And my fr- my ongoing frustration is other than Disney Pixar, Hollywood isn't making anything for children. Mm-hmm. They're not making anything. You know, the best family film this year so far has been Paddington 2, which uh-huh. is just wonderful. It's a British import. We don't make these movies lo- domestically anymore. So, um if if Teen Titans, if the Teen Titans movie turns out to be any good, and, and then later this year we've got a, a Spider-Man cartoon coming from Sony, I think that could be uh, salve to the wounds that I feel that <laughs> I can't share big screen superheroes with my youngest kids the way that you know when I was a kid, um, you know that's the com- my my comic books the, the stories the stories were aimed at children, and and now mm. everything. Every, everything's aiming at that PG-13 level. I think sure. that's unfortunate. Sure. We're talking you, about, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, one of the, um, the one of the titles that we've been talking about as a team that registers team is uh, uh, the Mr. Rogers documentary. You yes! Won't, yeah, you won't be my neighbor. Uh, won't you be my neighbor? Excuse me. Won't you yes. be my neighbor? Won't and we've been talking. Be yeah, exactly. <laughs> won't you be my neighbor? We've been talking about it because, well, first of all, there's a ton of buzz ar- about it in the sort of Catholic or Christian world. Um, but ha- have you seen it? And, and what 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 are you thinking? What are you thinking about it? I, I I have, and it's in theaters this weekend. I could. This is one of the movies so far this year that I'm most enthusiastic and urging just everyone to go see. It has got um, interviews with colleagues, with Roger's widow and his sons. It's mm-hmm. got archival cut footage from the show. But what comes across above more more than anything else in in this documentary, ninety minute documentary, is just the goodness and the gentleness that we remember from having watched this show as children, it's, it's real. It's who he was 24 hours a day. And you really, you really see that as, as you watch the documentary that this is, you know, Mr. Rogers is as improbable as this may seem. His reputation has actually grown in recent years. Right. Uh, people, I think sense that the, the times that we're living in are becoming, you know, in many ways, crueler and, and harsher. And, we, we recognize that we're not living the way that we should be. And we all kind of look back to Mr. Rogers and we know we know that what he told us when we were kids growing up is, is the truth. Right. And, and I think that's what people are really being um, affected in a powerful way by this documentary because it's – there's there's a there's a spiritual depth to it. You know, he was a Presbyterian minister. He was a Christian, and his faith, which is one of the subjects that they talk about in the film, really comes through in a powerful way. Absolutely. So, what are some of the other films that might be a bit off the radar that people uh, might want to consider this summer? Um, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of looking forward to what looks like a, an offbeat comedy called Tag, uh, which is about a, oh, an yeah. ongoing game of tag among among four friends that lasts for decades. Um, I, not off the beaten, not off the beaten path at all. But I, I have to say, the movie I'm most looking forward to is probably Mission Impossible Fallout. <laughs> um, somewhat improbably, after you know decades and for the first three films of the franchise, what I thought was largely spinning their wheels, Mission Impossible mm-hmm. has become the most entertaining franchise out yeah. there and and unlike star wars and and the marvel films they tell their stories with a beginning a middle and an end yeah. they're ridiculously entertaining they have brilliant set pieces spectacular stunts humor now that they've managed to put together a good team simon Pegg, ving rames jeremy renner now they've brought in rebecca ferguson and uh, if they pull this off I, uh, the last three mission impossible movies will just be the most satisfying action trilogy and i don't know how long 
And yeah. Rebecca Ferguson is worth just in herself the price of the ticket. Oh, she's fantastic. Yeah. I have more to say than I thought I did. So tag, going back to tag, isn't there, yes. uh, isn't, I know it's not really a part of the movie, but isn't there a priest who was involved in the, the original um, people who started this game of tag? I had not heard that. I know that it's a fact-based story. Uh, Jeremy Renner also is in this one, uh, Ed Helms, John Hamm. Um, and the trailer just looks like an absolute blast. If, if the movie pulls it off, it will. It, it's so offbeat. It's not, it's not, and it's not a brand name. It's not anything that you've ever heard of before. Uh, but I had. That's I had heard that some of the that. original uh, members who played this game of tag are either a priest or very religious. We were trying to follow, you know, track them down. But uh, but you know, these are these movies are based in part on on these. But I, okay, bringing there up is one a character. There is a character for I, I'm reading on Wikipedia right now. Sebastian Meniscalco plays a character who's only called Pastor. I don't know if that's okay. If that's maybe that's what I'm thinking. But let's squeeze in one more. I think uh, you wanted to talk about Mamma Mia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it's, it, I wanted to mention it because the first film was such a hit and really musicals have been um, uh, not, not something that necessarily critics have been raving about, but that have connected with audiences in a very powerful way. The Greatest Showman uh, last year with Hugh Jackman was, was a huge popular hit. The first Mamma Mia. And, um, you know, these movies also, they, what they have in common with, with Mission Impossible is a desire to entertain, to just mm -hmm. throw everything that they can at the audience, not in, you know, the way of like fan service and, and getting really geeky about the plots, the way that the Marvel and Star Wars movies do, but, but just connecting with people in, in a very straightforward way. And that's something that I can appreciate in a movie like Mamma Mia, even if, you know, as it, the, the critic snob in me kind of, that's, that's not really what I'm about, right. but, but I, but I appreciate a movie that just wants to entertain you and doesn't necessarily feel like it's there to sell you on, on coming back for the sequel. Deacon Steven, you're always a lot of fun when you're on register radio. So thanks for joining us again. Remember, for more news, analysis, and commentary, to check out the National Catholic Register online at ncregister.com. And, of course, you can always look for Deacon Stevens' films. He, he reviews them regularly for us. Also, check out our podcast at ncregister.com. Thanks for joining us here on Register Radio on EWTN. For Matthew Bunsen and our producer, Jeff Burson, I'm Jeanette DeMello. Until next week, God bless you. <laughs>